Good morning. Welcome to Spirit of Peace, where, no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. We welcome you to Spirit of Peace for World Communion Sunday. This is a special worship service led by the youth with some help from our friend, Katherine Peterson. World Communion Sunday was started in 1933 by Hugh Thompson Carr, a Presbyterian minister. This Sunday honors global Christian unity. Churches all around the world are celebrating World Communion Sunday along with us. Please join me in the call to worship. We gather today as the people of God, as a community of the followers of Jesus. We gather to share word and sacrament to discern the ways of faithful service. Where in the world shall we serve our God? At home, in business, in business place, in this community, and throughout every land. How in the world shall we serve our God? By working toward justice where there is oppression, by offering comfort where there is pain, by sharing love where there is hatred, why in the world shall we serve our God? Because Jesus directs us to enact our faith. Because the Spirit beckons us to respond. Let us now worship the Creator of all who calls us. We do so with abundant joy. Please join me in the opening prayer. The divinity in me adores the divinity in you. Namaste. 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 Let us pray together. My siblings, our help is in the name of the eternal God, who is making the heavens and the earth. Eternal Spirit, flow through our being and open our lips that our mouths may proclaim your praise. Let us worship the God of love. Alleluia. Alleluia. And now Catherine Peterson will assist us with the call and response hymn. glad all of you are here today. A special welcome to all of our guests. For those of you who are watching online, I encourage you to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube account. Whether you are here in person or watching virtually, you are all an important part of the Spirit of Peace community. We have a few announcements this morning. First, Pastor Charles is still away from church. Look at the most recent peace notes for information on when he'll be back and who to call if there is a pastoral care emergency. Next Sunday, Mona Wade will be preaching. Next, if you have any prayer requests today, please fill them out on the table near the sanctuary entrance and give them to our greeters. Thank you. Next, coming soon to your mailbox will be a letter from Pastor Charles about stewardship season. Included in the letter is a pledge card. Stewardship season is important because good stewardship means our church can better live out its mission in the coming year. 
Stewardship Sunday is coming up on November 7th, so please do your part to make sure Spirit of Peace enters the year 2022 in optimal fiscal health by filling out and returning your pledge card before the 7th. And last but not least, um, we have some information about the Spooktacular Auction. There are flyers at the end of each row here in the sanctuary, if you'd like to take a look at them. Uh, the auction is October, 20, uh, October 30th from 6 to 10 p.m. It is $25 per person, which includes a beautiful dinner, a uh, selection of creepy beverages, and deadly desserts. Costumes are not mandated, but they are highly recommended. You can decorate a mask. There will be a silent and live auction, and the goal is to raise $15,000. There's no bones about it. What you need to do is to sign up, bring family and friends. You can donate an, uh, an item to the auction and drop off the items to the church office beginning October 3rd, and you can volunteer to help. Um, just text Valerie Loudenbach and her phone number, 605-321-3945, to reach her by phone. It is now time for the passing of the peace. For those of you who are here in person, I invite you to stay seated, but wave to your neighbor. For those who are watching online, as well of, as well as for those of you who are, are in the sanctuary, I welcome you to pass the peace by giving someone a text message, Facebook message, an email, by giving them a phone call, or by passing the peace in whatever way you see, see fit. Peace be with you all. And now please join together for our next hymn, number 347 in your uh, hymnal. It is entitled, Let Us Talents and Tongues Employ. any uh, children in the sanctuary to come forward and we will have a children's moment with Maddie Loss and Dina Barth and if you are watching virtually gather around your screens.
Okay. Welcome to Children's Moment. My name's Maddie. That's Dino. What's your guys' names? What's your name? Ding. Ding. Shatana. Marcus. Alan. Alan. Dina. Dina. Maddie. Okay. Today we're going to talk about communion. What do you guys think communion is? Do you have any guesses? No, no. That's okay. When I was little, I used to think communion was just eating bread. I mean, at the simplest part of it, yeah. But it also is about sharing God's love and eating with people who you love as well. Today is an even more special day. It's called World Communion. It's where everyone around the world celebrates communion and has God's love. It's like when you're sitting at home and you're eating dinner with your family, that's communion. But when you open your doors and you invite friends and family and maybe a few pets over, that's world communion, where you all celebrate God's love. Okay, let's put our hands together into a little cup like communion, and let's bow our heads. Think of all the people around today sharing God's love. Dear God, please care for all the people around the world and give them your love and ours. Amen. point in our worship together where we share concerns and prayers and join together in prayer. I have the following prayer concerns that I would like to share with you, both concerns and joy, uh, from Catherine Lacey. There, she has three good friends. Two have left the sisters recently, and another lost her daughter. So we join in the grieving process for this. But she also adds that she has a prayer of joy for Spirit of Peace community, which is a source of compassion and a spur to action. Let it be so. And Trish offers a, offers a prayer for joy going into the seasonal change. And she expresses a particular prayer of joy for her aunt Pauline, who is moving here this week. And Cindy shares something that I think is in all of our minds. Let's pray for healthcare staff who are understandably exhausted. The hospital consensus, or our census is extremely high along with continued COVID hospitalizations. It's overwhelming, I think. But she also shares a special joy for the resilience of the healthcare staff. And Mona offers a special joy for the refreshing rain that we've been experiencing. It's greening up the earth in autumn. And Casey asked for prayers for Daniel, who was just let go from his new job this week and is seeking employment. Prayers with you, Dan. And here's one from Maya, which is a great start to the kindergarten school and kindergarten school year and special joy for all the grandchildren. And Lynette offers, asks for prayers for her niece. If you recall, a while ago, she was scheduled for heart surgery, but then contacted, contracted pneumonia, and so there's no heart surgery yet. So we pray for healing from the pneumonia, and then things can proceed to the next step. 
Now we'll have a time of silent prayer, and then Fawn will lead us in a pastoral prayer, moving into a Lakota prayer. Just recently, we have been experiencing different translations, different interpretations of what we call the Lord's Prayer. And as I was looking through our hymnal, I found that this Lakota prayer, it's not really a translation, but it seems to express the same kinds of sentiments. God, you call us into service to our neighbors, our families, our communities, the whole world, to your church, and to you. Give us all that we need to be peacemakers, prophets, visionaries, so we can do our part to make this world a better place for our neighbors, both near and far. We remember in our prayers all our joys and concerns. And God, you know there are more that remain silent yet, weigh heavily on our hearts. We give our thanks to you that no prayer is so silent that you cannot hear it. We lift these prayers using the word of a code of prayer of guidance. My spirit is one with you. Great spirit, you strengthen, you strengthen me day and night to share my very best with my brothers and sisters. You, whom my people see in all of creation and in all people, Show your love for us. Help me to know, like the soaring eagle, the heights of knowledge from the four directions. Fill me with the four virtues of fortitude, generosity, respect, and wisdom, so that I will help my people walk in the path of understanding and peace. Amen. It is now time for the offering. God has called each of us to be a part of Spirit of Peace. And so each of us is called to give in support of our church. For those of you who are here in person, I welcome you to come forward and place your offering in the basket. For those of you who are watching online, there are three ways you can give to Spirit of Peace today. First, you can text SOP, Spirit of Peace, no spaces, to 73256 to give via text message. If you prefer snail mail, you can mail in a check to 6509 South Cliff Avenue, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 57108. Or you can visit our website at www.spiritofpeacesf.org. Today is also a special day because we will be giving in support to the Neighbors in Need offering. Here is a video explaining more about this important offering and how your donations will impact our neighbors. Hello, my name is Bentley DeBardelaven. De I am the Executive Associate for Justice and Local Church Ministries. I am also the Administrator for the Neighbors in Need Special Mission Offering. And I'm Chris Davies, the Program Manager for Congregational Assessment, Support and Advancement. And I sit on the Granting Committee for Neighbors in Need. We're here to discuss in a nutshell what the Special Mission Offering supports. In the USA, the Neighbors in Need offering goes to justice and compassion projects. One third of all of the Neighbors in Need money goes towards the Council for American Indian Ministries. We're of love, we're peace, we're not warlike. We are my people, we're always spiritual. So that's what I wanted to tell people, that we're not against anyone, we just wanna to live too. The other two-thirds are used by the UCC's Justice and Witness Ministries towards projects of direct action, justice, and advocacy work. 
if we believe in a God who is loving and just, then to follow that God, we have to work for justice as well. If we don't all use our voices, those that aren't able to be heard stand in silence. Neighbors in Need grants are awarded to UCC churches and organizations doing justice work in their communities. The amounts range from $1,000 to $10,000 and are funded for projects doing direct service, community organizing, advocacy to address systemic injustice. My friends, we are living in a day where fear is reigning and we have an administration that is perpetuating that fear. In the face of fear, the only weapon that wins is love. Amen. For the past few years, the Neighbors in Need offering has been closely tied to the Three Great Loves campaign, engaging our love of God by focusing on love of children, love of creation, and love of neighbor. This year, the Neighbors in Need offering will focus on the love of neighbor by uplifting special projects engaging our immigrant neighbors and communities. I ask that the immigration authorities have mercy on me and that they give me my freedom. I want to thank everybody who has gathered here today. Those of you who are moms and dads know how difficult it would be to be separated from your children. Peace UCC in Webster Groves, Missouri, outside of St. Louis, was awarded $3,000 for a Freedom School program, which lasted six weeks during the summer months. The program ranged in age from kindergarten to second grade, at the end of which each student went home with books that reflected their diversity. Most importantly, the program cost nothing to any of the families. Friends, this is the good news of God, facilitated by presence, partnership, and patience. Will you please take your envelope and make a gift to Neighbors in Need today? We hope so. May God bless you, and thank you for your support. Please give and give generously. I invite you to pray with me. God, you have blessed each of us with so many gifts, and so we take some of these gifts and give them to your church. Bless these gifts, God, and may they strengthen spirit of peace so that we may be a beacon of, of hope in a time and place where hope is scarce. Amen. And now we will hear some inspiring music. Sometimes uh, I like to dig around in the choral library over at First Presbyterian, and I dug way to the back a while ago uh, and found this really fun arrangement of Just a Closer Walk with Thee, and I thought, boy, I know a good bass player, and I know a good drum player, Greg Olson, so let's bring them together. So uh, I hope this arrangement, it's really fun. Let it take you somewhere. Uh, I don't know where it'll take you, but I hope you enjoy this arrangement of Just a Closer Walk with Thee.
Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. As many of you know, I have a particular affinity, fascination, for parables. Frequently, parables are arresting stories with just enough ambiguity to make me think, what am I missing here? This leads to searching and pondering, which I always enjoy. Aha! Guess what? This is exactly what a parable, how a parable is supposed to work. Parabol, from the Greek, means comparison. So a parable is a teaching device, a literary form, but with a very specific purpose. It relates a compelling story to a specific audience. It presents a contrast to that audience, the listener's current behavior or attitude, and it challenges the audience to alter their perspective. Hmm. So keeping these two essential elements in mind, let's listen to this parable. To whom specifically is Jesus directing his criticism? Because it's a very important part of understanding a, par a parable to know to whom is it directed. What is his criticism? What is the challenge that he's urging them to accept? Now let's keep these in mind and hear now the parable from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And he said to them, you also go to the vineyard and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. Then the landowner went out again about noon, and about three o'clock he did the same. And about five o'clock he went out and found others still standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go to the vineyard. And then when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired around five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. <sighs> when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour, and we have made them, you've made them equal to us, who have spent the day in the hot sun. and have borne the burden of the work. But the landowner replied to one of them, friend, am, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree to the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last the same as I gave you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? And then Jesus closes the parable with this commentary. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. Please join me in a moment of prayer. Divine creative spirit, I sense a challenge within this story of Jesus. Help me humbly explore it with sincerity and vigor. 
Help us all to release preconceptions and open our minds. Please grant that my reflections be acceptable to you. Amen. When we encountered this parable recently in Bible study, an initial reaction was, that is really unfair. It's obviously the same reaction that the workers who had been there all day had. Those last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. A valid point, I think. A modern example would be an employee who has worked for a number of years receiving periodic raises and is now making a particular salary. The employer needs to hire some new people. The job environment has changed, though, and to attract applicants, the employer offers a higher beginning wage that is more than the current employee is earning. So now the inexperienced employee earns more than the veteran employee for the same job. If I were that veteran employee, my reaction would be a rather angry, that's not fair. But before I follow this path into disgruntlement, let's get back to the elements of the parable. In terms of Jesus' parable, we need to determine who is Jesus' audience. In this particular instance, Matthew is really not very helpful. He could have written, Jesus was speaking to the scribes and the Pharisees. And he does do that elsewhere in the gospel. Or he could have said, Jesus was talking with a group of workers. Nope. Nothing there, no easily discernible clue. So we need to become scriptural detectives. Matthew places this parable immediately after the story of the rich young man who comes to Jesus asking, what good deed must I do to inherit eternal life? Remember that Jesus' advice to the young rich man was to sell everything Give the proceeds to the poor and follow Jesus. After the young man leaves disappointed or grieving, Jesus observes, it is hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven. Now the disciples, a little confused as usual, start asking, well, who then can be saved? Finally, Peter, ever the bold, asks directly, look, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? And Matthew closes the story of the rich young man with a statement, but many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. Does that have a little bit of a familiar ring? Because the parable of the vineyard ends with exactly the same conclusion. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. So I think I have identified the audience to whom Jesus is directing the parable, Peter and the disciples. Now, if I needed confirmation of this hypothesis, right after this story, Matthew recounts an incident where the mother of two of the disciples approached Jesus and asked, as a favor, that he will appoint her sons to sit at either hand in the kingdom. I suspect she does this at the urging of her sons. Anyway, it causes a huge commotion among the disciples, anger, jealousy, you can imagine. Jesus breaks up the kerfuffle and issues this rebuke. You know that the rulers of the Gentiles rule it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, and whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. Ouch! Quite a reprimand. And recall the landowner's reply to the disgruntled workers. 
friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Point taken. The first workers did agree. They negotiated and agreed with the wage. And the denarius they received is apparently an appropriate wage for a day's labor. And then the landowner continues, I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? Another translation from the Greek would be, if your view of the matter is wicked, does that change the goodness of what I do? Then Matthew repeats the summary from the earlier story. So the last will be first, and the first will be last. You know, that phrase slips easily from the tongue, but if we really think about it in depth, it's a little disquieting. If I am among the rejected, those low on the totem pole, the marginalized, and that describes the majority of Jesus' audiences, this is indeed good news. But for the flip side of the social spectrum, those who are accustomed to being first, the upper echelon, the comfortable, the idea is far less appealing. And speaking as a comfortable one, that aphorism, the last will be first and the first will be last, is, well, discomforting. But I think we need to guard against too literal reeling of last first, first last, because that just establishes a reverse hierarchy. And I think the very idea of hierarchy is anathema to the life that Jesus is envisioning. Think of what Matthew said after the third iteration of the lesson. Don't be like the Gentiles. I think for Gentiles here, we can read the normalcy of civilization, like the real world, where the leaders, the powerful, the connected, are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, or it should not be so among his followers. Jesus says, because whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. I'm reminded of a phrase Corinne Armstrong makes in her book, 12 Steps to a Compassionate Life. It's a phrase that made a deep, lasting impression on her. Make place for the other. Make place for the other. It's a process of dethroning myself from the center position of my universe and placing someone else there, the other. Now, that's a pretty significant challenge. Yet, for me, at this point in my wrestling with the meaning of this parable, this is the essential message I hear Jesus giving Peter to all his disciples, to all his followers, then and now to you and me. Shift the focus from ourselves. Be as servants one to the other. I might refer to it as reciprocal servanthood. Or in the words of a hymn, the servant song, won't you let me be your servant? Let me be as Christ to you. Pray that I may have the grace to let you be my servant, too. Think for a moment how that parable starts. For the kingdom of heaven is like... Think of the words from the prayer Jesus taught, that God's kingdom arrive and that God's will be done here on earth. The challenge Jesus presents through this parable is daunting. But, oh, think what life could be if we lived with each other according to God's will and Jesus' example, 
fully within and observant of God's covenant. Divine Spirit, please help our response to Jesus' challenge be a resounding yes. Amen. When I chose this parable for today, I mainly did it because we had just encountered it in Bible study, and it was fascinating to me. But the deeper I got into it, the more I started to think, you know, this is appropriate for World Communion Sunday. Today, around the world, we celebrate a unity that transcends our diversity. In congregations around the world, the service of communion is celebrated. Some call it the Lord's Supper, others the Last Supper, Holy Communion, the Mass, the Divine Liturgy, the Eucharist. Even in those names, we encounter diversity within unity. Now, I thought the term Eucharist was simply a synonym for communion until this week, and then I discovered that it's actually from ecclesiastical Greek, Eucharistia, which means thanksgiving. You know, that really resonates with me. So I invite us all to come together for this thanksgiving that we share with the whole world. Now, first, some remarks specifically about here at Spirit of Peace. A table has been set forth, and we have three different breads. There are corn tortillas, Afghan naan, and gluten-free bread. When you are directed, I invite you to come forward and pick up the elephants carefully. But first, I need to remind everyone that all are welcome here at the table. You don't need to be a member of this church. You don't need to be a member of any church. You don't need to profess a particular creed or, or follow a particular catechism. We just want everyone to come who wants to be within a community of caring. And children are invited to take communion at the discretion of their parents or if you would rather, I'd be honored to offer a blessing. Now, as you come forward and carefully take the elements, I'm going to ask you for this service to carry them back to your seats, again, carefully, and wait so that we can all commune together. Please come forward. The table is prepared.
he took elements at the table that were important to that celebration. He took the bread. He blessed it. And then he broke it. And he offered it to all of his disciples, saying, take, eat. This is the bread of life I share with you. And in the same way, after supper, he took a cup. Poured the fruit of the vine into it. And he blessed it. Then Jesus said, this is a cup of blessing that I share with you. Do this whenever you're together, and remember me. Let us join in a communion thanksgiving prayer. Creator God, for centuries, Christians of different customs have gathered to commune with you and with each other through the sharing of this feast. In our partaking, you have been with them just as you are with us now. You provide for us the sustenance we need to respond to the cries of creation the bread of life, the cup of blessings, the gathered community. We go forth renewed and reinvigorated. May it be so. Amen. And now I invite us to join together in the final hymn number 576 for the healing of the nations or found on the screen. I think the melody of the hymn will be familiar. And so do pay special attention to the words. I think they speak to us. And if you're so inclined or able, you're welcome to rise for the singing of the hymn.
And now uh, the benediction, benediction is entitled A Blessing from Cuba. May God prosper you. May your days be long and your nights serene. May your friendships honor you and your family love you. May you eat at your table and may you be gathered into God's embrace with a smile. Amen.